Good morning, Union Progressive and friends. We are so excited to be with you this morning as we kick off Saturday Morning Connect. I am Melissa Bankovic, and I will be your host and moderator for today. Um, in the beginning, we'll go ahead and have a prayer this morning by Deacon Huey. Deacon Huey, you're muted. Okay, is that better? Yes, sir. Once again, good morning to everyone. It's such a beautiful day that the Lord has made. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, we come once again humbly before your throne. Thanksgiving in our heart for all of your many blessings. Father God, we thank you for watching over us last night as we slumbered and slept and you blessed us again with the opportunity to view a brand new day, a day that we didn't earn. Only your grace and your mercy that allow us to be at this place at this time. Father God, we ask that you just bless our pastor, Pastor Meredith. Ask that you just bless everyone who's tuned in to us this morning, especially our panelists who are going to share their wisdom and knowledge with us as we navigate through our current times. We ask a special blessing upon this inaugural uh, presentation of this relevant information to help us to navigate through this perilous and sinful times in this world. We ask that you bless the Union Progressive family, wherever they might be, the visitors and all those that take the time out to come and to learn. And we just applaud their efforts for kingdom building through the sharing of relevant information. As always, we thank you for the gift of our son, your son Jesus, who died on that cross that we might have a right to eternal life. And as we go throughout this day, we pray that everything that is said and done will be pleasing in our sight. Father God, we ask that you just navigate this day for us, Father God, and that everything will work out for the better on this Christian journey. These and all of the needful blessings we ask in the master's name of your son Jesus the Christ. And all those who love the Lord said, Amen, Amen, and Amen. Amen. Okay, so for the next hour or so, we will have a wonderful panel that will be discussing and answering questions related to how we can best navigate with our current situations. Um, with so much going on in our society, we definitely need to discuss what's happening and how we as believers and as a society can equip ourselves for this current season. Um, on our panel today, we have first is Pastor Anita Brown, who is a licensed RN and a life coach. Um, Pastor Anita is the face of empowerment, a transform excuse me, transformational leader, and one who has dedicated her life to prayer. She is the author of Move Mountain, My Prayer Count and is the founder of Well Watered Recovery Center. Welcome, Pastor Anita. Amen, thank you. You are welcome. So we also have Elandra Jones. Elandra is an Alabama, Alabama native who has 25 years of experience in the field of education. She holds a BS degree in both early childhood education and elementary education and a master's degree in curriculum and instruction. She is currently a teacher at Pickett Elementary and has been named Teacher of the Year three times. She is married to Henry Jones and has two children. Welcome, Ms. Jones. Good morning, welcome everyone. We also have Corinthian Morgan II, who is a retired police officer who worked with the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office for 25 years. Corinthian served as a patrol officer middle school resource officer, as well as the Operation Safe Streets, a community policing program. He holds a BS degree in criminal justice from Florida A&M University. 
Welcome, Deacon Morgan. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Good morning. Good morning. Our final panelist is Brenda Kane Titus. She is also a native of Jacksonville and a member of Impact Church. Since retiring from Citibank in 2000, she has been a business owner and actively involved in community, political, and social programs. Her experience includes managing political campaigns for local and state candidates, community organizing for voter registration, education, and mentoring young political candidates. She is married to Ben, and they have two children. Welcome, Sister Titus. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Good morning. Good morning. And again, thank you all for being here today. So let's get started. We have first up, Pastor Anita. Um, please talk to us today about health and care with COVID-19. Um, folks being stressed and mentally depleted with homeschooling their kids, isolation, political overload. How can we navigate this current you know, situation and landscape and take care of our mind, our bodies, and remain healthy? Um, well, I think I, I, I love definition. And so what I did in looking at your title, and your title says managing our current situation, and the definition of managing means to dominate with influence, to impact. And so we as a body of believers have to know that the scripture lets us know that we are the salt of the earth. And so I'm so pleased that we, are, we have this forum because because we are the salt of the earth, we should be the heads in, in the forefront, then we should be able to take um, outside of our spirituality, we ought to be able to be equipped. And one, another definition of manage means to continue to function. And that's what I think what this whole forum is today, that we as a body of people can continue to function. And so therefore with health, we have to know that we need to be able to function in our body, our mind and our soul and our spirit. And what we need to do is we need to educate ourselves and educate ourselves, not just to look at seeing what social media has to offer, but make sure that we do, do our due diligence as a people and go ahead and get the information that's out there so we can best take care of ourselves. The one key thing that I think, um, to, to keep us safe is to listen to the CDC, listen to our governor, listen to our mayors, but also know that it's not an injustice to us. Many times we're trying to function, but we're trying to do it our own way. And I think that we should be able to get our information and follow suit. Education means so much. Uh, in knowing what the COVID-19 virus is. The COVID-19 virus is a virus. It's not a bacteria where it can be cured with, uh, with just regular antibiotics. And so therefore, the things that we need to do, we need to literally understand who the virus or what the virus is attacking. And so I jotted down some things that COVID-19 does attack. It attacks the elderly. It attacks predisposition uh, uh, pre of illnesses like um, respiratory problems, um, cardiovascular problems. So if we know that we have those issues already functioning, in our life, we need to be careful. And I, I say be careful, but not afraid. Because we as a body of believers, we can't be afraid of COVID-19, of the virus, for that matter, anything. Um, because we're fighting an a invisible foe. And we've always fought an invisible foe, not just before COVID, but our foe has always been an invisible one. So I think once we educate ourselves and knowing what, what, what's, at, what's at stake, so therefore, I want to encourage all of us to do your due diligence. And if you have a fever, cough, shortness of breath, difficulty breathing, fatigue, headaches, sore throat, congestion, runny nose, then don't come to church. Don't go out in public. You know, make sure um, that you wear your mask. And we see the mask all over. But one thing I want to let everybody know, put your mask over your nose. And many times people are not putting their mask over their nose. They're just putting it over their, their mouth. But we need to put it over our nose because the virus attacks your nasal passages, your sinuses, your respiratory tract. And then when it gets in, it lodges there. So therefore, we need to make sure we do our education to make sure that we get the proper rest, make sure that we um, um, 
make sure that we exercise. And that's something that we're not used to doing. So we just need to just educate ourselves. Um, one thing I also would love to just highlight is gloves. And then I see people in public wearing gloves. That is a disservice. Do not wear gloves outside because we, we, we think that we're doing, you know, we're safe, we're, we're, um, we're being protected, but in actuality, everything you touch with those gloves, you touch your eyeglasses, you touch your cell phone, you touch your debit cards or your credit cards, you touch your keys. So therefore you're bringing that, those germs or whatever is infected right back into you. So we wanna make sure that, you know, you carry your, your hand sanitizer. And as a licensed RN, we're trained that once you hand sanitize three times, then you need to use hot soapy water for at least 20 seconds. And that's the happy birthday song or singing the ABCs just in your head. So I think that we just need to make sure that we educate ourselves and don't follow suit with what you see others do. You don't have to wear the, the gas chamber mask that I see people in. Are on just your regular mask that protects you while you're in public. You're only going to be in public to the grocery store, you know, to, to pick up a few items. So soon as you get home, then you need to go ahead, take your mask off, hand sanitize your hand, and then wash your hands when you get home. So I think education is the key and not fretting um, and not worrying and then not being full of fear, not letting social media and not letting what others say fear us. We cannot be afraid because we have power but also the lord give us common sense as well so wear your mask do your social distancing and do those things that um that the cdc and the government uh is telling us to do one last point if i might interject because there's no cure and there's nothing that we could eat to help us one thing we can do is make sure we are hydrated make sure that you you know you're constantly drinking you're constantly drinking and because there is no cure we still need to boost our immune system and when i say boost your immune immune system because if the virus attacks are already weakened body or already feeble body then that means that you don't have anything to fight with so because now while you're healthy i encourage you to eat your fresh fruits and vegetables stay away from a lot of canned foods a lot of salty foods you know stay away from a lot of things that's gonna you know just slug you and slow you down but you want to build up on your vitamin c you want to build up on your zinc you want to build up on your ginger and your fresh fruits and your fresh vegetables i heard somebody say it costs too much to be expense you know to uh to be healthy but i'd rather you know pay it now than to pay it later so i feel like you know, we need to invest in not a lot of fast foods not a lot of processed foods because we don't know when covid is going to go away so therefore while we have time to build up and make sure that our body is immune. One last point with our children, because our children are home all the time, we need to make sure that we don't, you know, just load them with a lot of sodas, with a lot of sugary drinks, with a lot of fast foods while they are at home, because they are affected as well. So we need to make sure that it's so easy just to go to Popeyes or so easy to go to McDonald's or Chick-fil-A or whatever those, um, whatever those restaurants may be, but we have to make sure that while our children are at home, that we make sure we load them up on vitamins and fresh fruits and fresh vegetables and are not a lot of sugary drinks. And I tell people like this, I know my time is winding down, uh, this, this virus or the COVID uh, issues that we're facing has nothing to do with whether or not we like it. I don't like to drink some things. I don't like some of the elderberries. I don't like some of the, the things that is healthy. Has nothing to do with whether it tastes good, but it does matter whether it's good for us. Awesome information. Thank you so much. Oh, wow. Thank you again. That was great information, Pastor Brown. Um, mm -hmm. Wearing those masks. Wow. Yes. <laughs> there um, much. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so next up we have Sister Elandra Jones. Um, similar question, you know, talk to us about your educational system. What should we know related to educating our children and the current situation families and educators are finding themselves in right now? 
Well, once again, good morning to everyone. So I'm going to share uh, some simple information about what we as a public school system is doing and currently doing. Uh, we currently have three options available for uh, student enrollment, which one being do all virtual, which is a 12, 12 month program, well, 10 month program. It's for the entire school year and the student remains online for the entire school year. With do all virtual, the, uh, the, te the teachers are local teachers, but they are not uh, necessarily at that child's school. The next one is Duval Homeroom, which came about because of COVID. And those teachers are from normally from the child's school, but with the upcoming school year, your child could actually be assigned to another teacher, same grade level, but from a different school. Uh, for Duval Homeroom, it's quarterly enrollment as of September 25th, yesterday. Yesterday was the um, enrollment deadline. If you elected to stay in Duval Homeroom, there was no need to re-enroll. But if you want your child to return to a brick and mortar, which is the classroom, the school itself, yesterday was a deadline. Uh, in the past, they did extend the deadline. We haven't received anything as of today, whether or not they are extending that deadline so that, it, that children who elect to go back to the classroom can go back. Um, those children who have elected to return back to the classroom for uh, from Duval Homeroom actually return on October 19th, which is the beginning of the second semester. Those who elected to do Duval Homeroom were required to stay for the first grading period. And then each after each grading period, there's the option to either re-enroll or to um, return to the classroom. Then the last option is the brick and mortar, which is the classroom itself. Um, with the classroom itself, uh, with a, like with a normal school year, the child receives all of the um, benefits and accommodations that the uh, school would normally provide during the school year. Uh, with the exception of now, with COVID, all the precautions that have been taken that are, are in place, as far as social distancing, uh, sanitizing, uh, before the children even get out the car or off, off the bus, temperatures are taken. If there are any temperatures or anything like that, those students are required to go back home. Uh, there's a 24 hour waiting period for any child who runs a temperature. If there are any other signs that may or may not be COVID related, that they are required to go to the doctor and present uh, documentation that they have been seen by a physician. Uh, any, chi any child who runs a temperature throughout the day is uh, sent to an isolation room and the parents are immediately contacted. For, for families, for all parents, all parents should get a focus account. A focus account is an account where the, ch where the, the uh, parent themselves is able to monitor all of the students uh, academic performance in addition to access to the grades. The parents have the parent academy which presents all type of information as that's COVID related, school related, district related. Uh, the parent is able to pay fees there, uh, access to the code of conduct. All of this information is available to the parents through a parent focus account. The parent can access or uh, create a focus account by simply logging onto the Duval County Home Room page. So um, that's important that all parents, especially now, that all parents do create an account. And it doesn't matter how many kids you have in school, you can connect all the children to that account. So you only need to create one account and all of your kids are create, you monitor from uh, one account. Um, on the uh, Duval Home Room homepage, there is a student and family tab. Underneath that tab, you're able to find out about the uh, COVID situations in not only your child's school, but for the entire county. Uh, you are able to um, find out all the information that the uh, county is presenting or the schools are presenting um, as far as any changes or updates. The other thing is um, when it comes to online uh, education, does every, I mean, some students should online works well for them, but there are some students 
especially students who are titled ESE or have other learning disabilities. Some of the time online might not be a good choice because those students require additional support. And if they're in an environment or a home or learning situation where there's no one there to provide that, that support, it is recommended that those students do return back, back to brick and mortar even though there are VE, which are vocational educational teachers who reach out to those students, those students still require additional help. Because this year, unlike the spring, when we first ran into COVID, all the uh, standardized testing was uh, considered null, null and void because they didn't uh, do it. But this year, all standardized testing, district testing, baseline testing, all of that will take place this year. So there's a lot of instruction that takes place that those students will need that that will help them to be successful. And that's that's one of the things with us uh, in the school year like we did, there is a big learning gap. It's very noticeable whether the students are online because um, all of the um, pre assessments have taken place now, whether the student was online or in brick and mortar. So from the uh, feedback that a lot of the uh, data is showing that the learning gap has increased tremendously. So there's a lot of catch up that uh, needs to take place before the spring, before the actual state testing, the FSA, uh, those advanced placement testing for our high school uh, students. Before all of that testing uh, takes place, there are a lot of learning gaps that need to be filled. So, um, for those students that are choosing to be online, it's important that their academic um, progress is being monitored by someone uh, from their family, in particular the parents, to make sure that the students are doing the assignments, uh, that they're logging in like they're supposed to, um, that they're communicating with the teachers when they have problems. Uh, the learning platforms that the uh, county has come up with uh, for parents because everything, uh, SAC, PTA, all of those things are still uh, taking place, including uh, conferences with parents. Uh, the county is using GoToMe, they're using Zoom, they're using uh, Class Dojo. All of those are uh, platforms that the schools are using now because of COVID. There are no uh, in-person uh, visits anymore, but everything is on a uh, platform. So it's very important that the parents do create those uh, focus accounts so that they can have access to all of that and stay in the loop as far as the child's academic needs, the child's academic performance, and then what the county is doing. Um, the other thing is for those students who did do Duval Homeroom, or those who did it temporarily, in particular the uh, high school and middle school students, they have uh, began the transition back to the classroom. As of Monday, the uh, final wave of uh, students uh, returning back to the classroom will be the high school students. And as of Monday, for all of those uh, students, they will be returning back. The sixth grade started back uh, two weeks ago. Uh, middle school seventh and eight uh, finished up on last week and now Monday uh, comes the high school students. So all of those students who have elected to go back to the classroom, uh, Monday is the official start where they will return back to a five day uh, week instead of the uh, hybrid uh, some days and then some days they were uh, strictly online. Um, Something else, um, I know there were a lot of concerns about how safe is the school environment when it comes to um, sanitizing, social distances and all of that stuff. Uh, within the classrooms and in the schools itself, the schools have set up um, staggered lunch times. They have done markings throughout all of the schools uh, where social distance is, um, social distance itself is being displayed so that the children are aware of you know where they're standing and in their proximity so those things are in place in addition um 
there is assigned seating, assigned seating. And when you create the focus account, you will be able to see it so that they'll be, they'll be able to do contact tracing. So when it comes to uh, classrooms, you are able to see who the child is sitting with uh, and, and that child sits or is in that uh, proximity of the same children throughout the entire day. That even includes in the uh, cafeteria. Um, the uh, transitions from one class to another, those also are signed, and it's also a sign on my buses as well. So it just doesn't, um, the uh, social distance and contact tracing in the event that something should happen, they have uh, signed seats, so assigned seats, assigned placements, so it's easy to see who someone had come, came in contact with. Uh, that also, you'll be able to see if you create the focus account because it's also part of the student's grade portal. And not only are the students able to see it, but uh, the teachers, the principals, and downtown also has a record of where every child sits, uh, whether it's in the classroom, the cafeteria, or the bus. Um, let's see, is there anything else? Again, the student and families tab on the uh, Duval County homeroom page, you will find uh, the information as far as logging in, creating accounts, accessing accounts, and also how to navigate the different platforms. Because a lot, with a lot of the online stuff, it, it can be difficult. And that's one of the things when it comes to the smaller kids, that I have chosen the option of Duval uh, online or Duval Homeroom online. With a lot of the different uh, platforms, they require adults or someone who is uh, computer, computer literacy, literacy uh, that they are able to help those children to be able to navigate through some of the different platforms that they have chosen. A lot of the different learning programs that the uh, students are learning are using or new programs that the uh, county adopted. So those do require additional help because the programs itself are new. It's not some that uh, some of the younger kids are familiar with. So those will require adult help. Uh, those children who are ESE still receive services but again, um, it is highly recommended if you have a child who has an IEP or is ESE, has been uh, labeled ESE, that that child receives the proper care and it is most effective if that child actually is in a brick and mortar school so that they can get the additional one-to-one, -one, the pull-out help that they need. Uh, for all the students, all the students are required to wear masks or shields. For the upper grades, they do have desk protectors. Um, they're not sharing, again, because I told you that they do have assigned seats. So they're not sharing the same desk as someone else. And um, sanit sanitizing the desk, the tables, anything the students come in contact with, with the amount of wipes and disinfectant and cleaners that they have. The students, in addition to the teachers and the custodial staff, are cleaning throughout the day. There are periods where they simply stop to clean, to sanitize, and to disinfect. Um, the other thing is when it comes to uh, the water fountains and things like that, they don't have those anymore. It's um, the uh, water stations where they're the disposable cups that they're actually using. So all of that has, um, is no longer in use. The uh, final thing is um, after school activities, at all after school activities are starting to take place and have been taking place uh, over the past couple of weeks when it comes to uh, varsity sports and things like that. Ticketing uh, is online. Uh, there are no ticket booths anymore. So all of that is online as well. Uh, the schools themselves uh, provide the websites so that um, anything that any uh, tickets that you're purchasing is limited as well, just like the Jaguar games, it's a limited uh, capacity uh, for those type of sports. And uh, finally, um, 
when it comes to uh, launches for those students who are on Duval Homeroom, not Duval Virtual, but Duval Homeroom, those students um, are allowed to attend any school to get free lunches throughout the day. Uh, there is a, a set time by the different schools where they are served um, free lunches. There's no ID or anything required. And it doesn't have to be the school that they attend, but it could be a neighborhood school or any public uh, school. I hope this was helpful to uh, everyone. So again, thank you for having me as well. Thank you so much, Sister Jones. That was a lot of information that we definitely needed to hear about our school system. So up next, our panelist is Ms. Brenda. Um, we have an upcoming election, as you know, and we'd love for you to talk to us about the landscape and what information voters need to know. Thank you again so much for having me and uh, thank you Union Progressive for you know, having this e event. Because um, I believe that the church is a natural and critical resource when it comes to taking care of the whole body, right? Just like Sister Brown was uh, saying. Uh, James 2, 15, 16 says, if a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? So one way we can impact the needs, uh, those in need, is by ed being educated and participative in the voting process. Because voting impacts uh, so many aspects of our lives, our communities, our schools, our grocery stores in our communities, access to health facilities, fire and police services, our parks, and not only voting, but I'm a plug census participating in this as well, although I'm not gonna talk about it uh, that much, but census is uh, very important to uh, the whole body of our people. So as I kind of go through this and talk about our civic responsibility, um, there is a, a questionnaire that's going to pop up. It has two questions. It's a survey that I'm doing, and it is going to pop up on your screen. So, Jante, if you would put that up, and if you guys could answer it really quickly, that would absolutely be awesome. And once you answer it, it'll end the just end the poll. Thank you. Uh, first, we have to be educated on why it's important to participate. Voting is a personal right, and every citizen of this country has that right. Now, there are things that can take away that right, like felony convictions and voter inactivity, and there are real tactics uh, to suppress the voter rights, like poll tax and gerrymandering. So we have to know that our vote is valuable and that it should not be taken lightly. That also means that we can't fall into the trap of not talking to our brothers and sisters about voting. We are stronger when we stand together to make change, especially in this particular climate. We cannot be silent about anything affecting God's people. Our vote is valuable, but not voting is even more expensive and more costly to our people. Secondly, we must understand and be educated on the process and the systems. Most people get engaged in voting uh, every four years, presidential elections. However, the greatest impact of your vote, of our vote, is in local and state elections, which can happen every two years. So it's about give those we give the power to make laws and make the policies. Some of the voting obstacles that we're facing today is actually uh, influenced by the people that we elect on the local and state um, systems. Uh, so did you know that the obstacles we're facing like uh, restoration of rights, the polling places that we actually go to, whether we voted by mail, uh, the hours that we vote, they're influenced by the governor, 
our attorney general, and even our local supervisor of elections. And on a federal level, did you know that over the last three years, 198 federal judges have been appointed to lifetime positions, lifetime positions in the courts, and none of those 198 are people of color. These obstacles and tactics, they are real and they can work if we don't fight against them. So if we want fair representation in the process, we have to vote for representation. Thirdly, it's more than just voting, it's being involved. God's people should be the ones in leadership positions to truly impact the care of God's people. First Peter 4.10 says, as each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. So our part as the body of Christ is to ensure leaders of character, leaders with compassion, leaders with sound minds, leaders with the heart of God and a love for God's people are the ones who are making decisions for us. Community leaders should really come from within the gospel teaching church. So lastly, some key things we can do to navigate in this uh, current climate. We're gonna um, show some of these things on the list, Jante, if you can um, now put up the list of things. Uh, these things that we can do, we can, we should always pray uh, for our communities and pray for our leaders. We should register to vote and participate in all levels of voting. When you participate in all levels, this keeps you on the rolls as an active voter. And in this season, the last day to register to vote is, I, I incorrectly put October the 1st, it is actually October the 5th. So that is your last day to register. Uh, you should check your voter status, update your records, and please, please make a plan to vote. And that could either be voting by mail or voting in person. And if you choose to vote in person, choose an early voting date. In our county, we have two weeks of early voting. So pick a day between October 19th and November 1st from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. to go and vote. The other thing we can do is register young people to vote. And you can register them begin at the age of 17 so that they're ready to vote at the age of 18. And there are other things, you know, when we talk about teaching our children, take them with you when you go to vote. Teach them about voting rights. You know, tell them why you're voting. The other, um, some of the other things we can do is uh, volunteer in the community. And that's volunteering during the voting process, uh, like being a poll watcher, or uh, voting uh, on voting day going and being a part of that process. That also helps teach our kids about the voting. We, you should also attend your homeowners association meetings and your CPAC meetings. Those uh, meetings are within your community and they actually are a feeder to let you know what's going on in our city and in your particular community. So participate in that and run for office. One of the things that we shy away from is people of God, people in the church, not wanting to be involved in politics. But if we want to really be an influence, we need to step up and vote. If God has given you a gift, let's share it and let's be a part of the process. And then one last important thing is to hold our elected officials accountable. Hold them accountable. That actually means going to the town hall meetings, going to the school board meetings, the city hall meetings. Contact your local, your state, and your federal officials and let them know how you feel about their decisions and what your voice is on certain votes that they are going to take. The work that um, 
they they work for you. Your voice is what they need to listen to. They work for you whether you have voted for them or not. And as a people, we tend to disengage after we voted. And that's not the end of the voice because your voice is valuable. It's a valuable commodity. And so we want to use it by voting. And there's some key um, websites that are out there to tell you about um, how your status is. And we can list some of those as um, DuvalElections.com. You can log on to there. It's very easy friendly. It can tell you your status. It can tell, let you change your address. It can let you register. And in the voting by mail process, it can actually help you track your vote and show you when your vote has counted with vote by mail, okay? Um, there's also ways to get involved. You can go to uh, IWillVote.com or either text the word vote to 30330. And those are, are websites and places where you can go to volunteer and it will give you uh, local uh, agencies that can use your help. So thank you very much uh, for uh, le letting me have this time to share with you the importance of voting. Thank you so much. And we all know we must vote in order to hear, you know, be able to let our voices be heard. So we definitely need to make sure we're voting this year. Okay, up next is Deacon Morgan. Um, all of us have seen what is happening with protests related to social justice police brutality and even messaging of defund the police. What is the conversation that we should be having to navigate within that current situation? Um, help us to understand social justice and policing. Good morning and thank you again for having me and as well as having this forum in order that we can share information and speak out. Um, when it comes to social justicing, I don't think that it's, that it's anything that's exactly new to us or anything that we've never heard of before. If we go back to the era of Martin Luther King and, and Malcolm X, it's really all the same thing. But most of all, I think most people are using the social justice uh, menu or avenue in order to just to have their voices heard. And I think we all want our voices to be heard, um, but it's just a certain way that that needs to be done. Um, I don't, <laughs> protesting is great. Um, but when we do protest, we have to understand that there's a legal way to protest and there's an illegal way to protest. Um, the law allows you to protest, but it allows you to peacefully and legally protest. I think the problem that we're having and, and, and part of the conversation that we need to have is the same one that I've, 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 I've actually had to have with my, my 18 year old and even my 19 year old. Um, my 18 year old wanted to participate in a protest down at the beach. But I think that, you know, the thing that I had to tell her is that number one, we have to research the avenue that we're going to protest in. In other words, I think we have to research what actual uh, organization is actually doing the protesting and find out what they actually stand for. Um, and then we have to actually research and find out how organized this actual protest is. Because if the protest is organized, and the protest will probably be legal. Um, so we have to do that because there's a, there are, you know, we, we've all seen things on the news and read things in social media about protests and how things can get out of hand and how some people are just there to cause problems, to cause trouble, uh, to destroy property and to do things illegally. So, you know, there's always that chance that that is going to happen. But protesting is very important, but I think a lot of that shies the people, shy, shy, will make people shy away from actually wanting to protest or wanting to participate in protests. So um, when we protest, and we're protesting for, for, for social justice, um, which is another big, um, which is another actually big, uh, a big thing uh, or big, or big avenue that we want to, or cause that we want to champion. Um, social justice is nothing new. Um, I think the only thing that actually brings it to light is just nowadays, 
everything is on the airwaves. You have social media, you have news, you have radio. Um, so a lot of it is more out there than anything else. But actually what has been going on as far as us championing for social justice has always been going on. It's just that we see it a lot more now. Um, social justice is a good avenue to have. But once again, that's the way that we want to have our voices heard. And we do that through the social justice menu or the social justice avenue, um, as well as when it comes to actually trying to defund the police. Um, I think, first of all, you know, the view that I got when it came to defunding the police, we all know that, that the, the city, our city's budgets are heavily impacted on police monies. In other words, there's a great percentage of our budget from our cities that actually go to the police. Now, when we say that we want to defund the police, I don't think we're actually talking about taking or, or getting rid of our police departments. What we're saying is that we need to take some of those funds or some of those resources and allocate them somewhere else. Yeah. A big problem that I had um, working for 25 years with the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office is that the police are called for everything. Um, there's nothing that you are not called for. Um, a lot of it, I would say 60 to 70% of the calls that you get for being a police officer are not police related. Uh, there are certain things that we can use that money for, so we can not defund the police, but we can reallocate those funds, health counselors or the social workers, in order so they can tackle the problems that we are actually, they say that they train you for them, but are you truly trained for a mental health issue? What they do is they're, they're training you to recognize a mental health issue, but you are actually not trained to handle the mental health issue. Now they do train you to take them somewhere. There is a mental health issue, but yet still we need to have people in place, mental health counselors, social workers, in order to tackle those problems or to tackle those issues that we cannot handle. And even if we do handle those mental health issues as a police officer, there's a 90% chance that we're going to get called right back to that same address. For several years working one area, I knew all my mental health houses because I always had to go to this one house for the same issue. Another thing is that when we talk about um, defunding the police is that police departments don't want to let go of their funding. And it's very important that they are funded but they don't want to let go of the actual funding that they do have. Um, and so that, that therefore that is always going to be a fight. But one of the things we have to realize as well is that when we do protest and when we do protest for social justice, if you haven't heard lately, you see where the governor is trying to put some laws into place where certain things will happen if you are destroying property or you cause havoc or, or there's some violence going on in protest, that will let us know that they really mean business when it comes to us peacefully protesting. They really mean business when they come to us peacefully protesting. So in saying that, I would say this. We all want our voices to be heard. Protesting, getting a part of social justice menus or social justice avenues is a great way to have your, 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 your voices heard. But voting is the best way. Um, to piggyback off of uh, Sister Brenda, Voting is the best way to do that. But we also need to take to the streets as a people to understand that, yes, they need to know how we feel, but not only know how we feel, we need to show them how we feel. So the conversations that we should be having when it comes to protesting social justice and police brutality, which is another issue, um, police brutality has always gone on. I mean, you have to look back to why policing was actually created. And once you look back on how policing was actually created, you will see that over the years, nothing much has changed. Police brutality is more prevalent today, or we know that it's more prevalent today, is because we see it more, because of the avenues that we have when it comes to media and when it comes to, to, uh, to, to, to our, social, uh, our social websites. That's where it becomes more prevalent. There's been police brutality for years in every department. That's because you have people that who have a different view of how to do policing. Now, when it comes to police brutality, we have to understand 
that in this climate, in this day and time, and I'll and I'll and I'll I'll go back to the to the most recent thing, which is the Breonna Taylor thing, and and how that 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 indictment was 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 um was not favorable to her to her and her family. We have to understand it, and and a lot of us aren't educated. Me being in the position that I was, I was educated and know how the process works. We don't know the process. And when you don't know the process, that's when things can get scary for us. And that's when we can uh, protest enhances. And that's when things be can, can become violent, like, what, like, like what's going on in Kentucky right now, is because we don't actually know the process. But the only way that you can know the process is that you have to get involved. You have to understand what is going on in our police departments and how they train police officers and what they teach police officers. This is done day in and day out through our Jacksonville Sheriff's Office. They have what they call a, a Citizens Police Academy that you can sign up and that you can attend. And I think it's probably like a six week course and I think you go at night or evening hours or whatever and they will teach you how police officers are trained, how they're interacting with, with the public, and how you know you can avoid certain situations. So in the police and citizens police academy, I think they give you very good information and you begin to understand the process and how things are handled. And not only that, but you know, and that's just on a small local level, but even on the state level and on a federal level, we have to understand that our court system is not made for us. Our court system was not created by us. It is not favorable to us but we have to do things to make it favorable to us. And one of the best things that we can do to make it favorable for us is to get educated about it. When you're educated about it, or like I like to tell my children all the time, if you know the playbook, then you know how to play by the rules. And you have to know how to play by the rules to get the most out of it for you. So, you know, like I said on the onset, you know, I have an 18 year old is here and I have a 19 year old in college. They all want to be involved in our social justice and they all want to protest and their voices heard. But, you know, with my 19 year old, with her being in college and on scholarship, she has to be mindful about what she does. She has to be mindful about what she posts. She has to be mindful about the conversations that she has because there's a good chance that you can lose your scholarship because of what you say or because of what you post. My 18 year old wants to go down and be hands on and wants to participate. But as a parent, the conversation that I had to have with her, and I think we need to be having with a lot of our, 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 our 18, 19, 25, 26 year olds, is that you have to count the cost. Like my daddy always said, you have to count the cost. Sometimes it's just not worth it. You have to do your research and you have to be involved. Uh, mm -hmm. Once again, I'd like to say thank you for giving me this opportunity. Um, and I look forward to what's coming next. Thank you. Thank you so much, Deacon Morgan. That was some great information. As you know, we should definitely be aware of what our rights are so we can know how to proceed with any situation. So it looks like we are gonna run over a little bit. Wanna make sure our panelists are okay with moving forward with questions. Okay. All right, that is great. Thank you guys so much for all the insight and all the information that you have given us. So in order to proceed into our next area of questions, we would like for everyone to follow these um, directions. Um, if you have a question and you would like to ask the panel, you can submit it through the chat for the question and X answer function or use the raise your hand option in Zoom and we will open your mic for you to answer, you know, ask the question to the panel, okay? So first I would have, like to ask a few questions that we have here. Um, one is to Sister Anita. Pastor Anita, are you there? Yes, yeah, yeah, I oh. am. All right. All right, so what are some of the some of the things that we can do to support our mental and physical health in these challenging times? Do you have any suggestions for our viewers? 
Uh, yes, when um, Deacon uh, Morgan was talking, I was just so um, elated when he said that we ought to, when they call the police about mental health, and I think as a body of people, we have to get involved in mental issue, in mental health, because um, mental health uh, uh, is so vital um, to our population. First of all, we as a people got to acknowledge that there are mental health issues and not chalk them off as, so to speak, being crazy or whatever. So we have to let them know to educate, to mentor, and to be there, especially as an organization. I think a lot of times, I think um, Sister Brenda said that we are to get involved. And so oftentimes we as a people, as a church body, we don't like to get involved with stuff. We just say, let that happen to somebody else. But we have to get involved. And my motto here at our center is that one-on-one -on -one information, that one-on-one -on -one counsel, that one-on-one -on -one making sure that you know that, that, that mental health does happen and making sure that we get the information and the, the answers to, especially our black uh, brothers and sisters and get that information to them. So mental health is real. Um, and I think when we get involved, knowing what to do, how to do, and making sure that they get the help. I believe in prayer. I believe in land on of hands and all of that. But at the end of the day, we got to make sure that they are taking their regimens, that they are taking their medication, and that they are aware that the issue exists. So just being involved, being hands-on, and acknowledging there is a problem. And then when you find out that there is a problem, let's, as a body, you know, counsel and mentor and coach and let them know that we're here for them, not just to lock them up in an institution, but to sit down and train and organize and make sure that they get the long-term help that they need to be successful in our society. Okay. Great information. That is so true um, in so many different homes. Um, some of the kids and family members are not being treated because they just don't know. So yeah, definitely make sure um, you're getting the proper medication and following suit with the doctors. So our next question um, will go to Sister Jones. Um, is the curriculum the same for virtual as well as in person? The curriculum is the same, but how it is uh, implemented is a lot different given the fact that you're online. The resources are a lot different when you're in the classroom and the resources are there. So for online and uh, in, in person, I would say even though the curriculum is the same, the way that it is implemented is quite different. When you're given a, given a student that's in front of you, there's a lot more hands-on and a lot more resources that you have readily avail, available. But when you're teaching online, there's only so much you can do as a teacher, and there's a limited number of resources that that child might have at home. And so implementing it is a lot different when you're online and you're listening to someone or listening to uh, the teacher, and the teacher is giving you an example when you're in the classroom, you actually have that hands-on example that you're able to use to manipulate. So, uh, and the tools that the teacher had have uh, access to are a lot different than when it comes to those that are online. So it, it, it is a lot different, but when it comes to the testing itself, and that's the catcher, when it comes to the testing itself, the test is the same. So the test is the same, even though the curriculum and the curriculum is the same, but it's being implemented differently because of the avenue that you're using, whether you're in person or not, uh, whether you're in person, you it's the idea that you have so many different tools to your advantage and uh, that child that you're able to see who is and who is not getting it and what needs to be retaught. When you're online, there there's a limited uh, amount of um, contact, so you can't really say, okay, uh, this child needs additional help, because what you would do in the classroom with that same curriculum, you can't do online. You, you can't do that online. Uh, one of the uh, reasons being, um, online, a lot of the uh, teachers, because of the number of students who chose online, 
it's um, a lot, a lot of students, and some of the students uh, might not even be from your uh, school, your particular school. So there, there uh, comes in a familiarity of which students you're working with or uh, the number of students you're working with. So same curriculum, but it's implemented different. Same testing to be uh, determine whether or not that child is successful or not. Great. Great information. Um, as being a mom with two girls that are home, I do understand. <laughs> it is different. <laughs> okay, so we are going to take a question from the chat. Um, this is directly for Sister Brenda. Um, Sister well, Williams is asking, my plan is to vote in person early, but if I ordered a mail-in ballot, will there be a problem situation when I go in person to vote? Okay, thank you so much for that question. And first of all, if you have ordered your mail-in ballot, um, you should be receiving it soon. Uh, matter of fact, I received mine on yesterday. They started mailing out on uh, Thursday and I got it Friday. If you take your ballot with you, if you want to go on early vote, you can take your uh, vote by mail ballot with you to any early voting uh, site and they will void that ballot and give you another ballot. They will give you your early voting ballot that you can then vote in uh, in person early voting. So just take it with you. Don't complete it. Just take it with you. They should void it out and give you a brand new ballot. Now, if you complete the vote by mail ballot, you can take it to any um, vote by mail. I mean, I'm sorry, early voting site and drop it off. And uh, there is a uh, lot box uh, at the polling inside uh, that you should be able to drop off your completed vote by mail ballot. Hopefully that's helpful. That's good stuff. That's great information. I know a lot of us are doing things from home these days and that would be awesome. I didn't realize we could actually drop it off. So that's great. <laughs> yes. yes, you can drop it off any, any early voting site or either go to the supervisor of elections, or you can do it in the mail if you yeah. like to do it in the mail, but you can drop it off. Good. Yeah. Great Good information. Okay, so I want to, um, I know we have another question that came in the chat um, for Sister Jones. Um, could you explain how the lunch periods are being handled um, in some of the schools? Okay, <clears throat> in the, um, the lunch periods or uh, the lunch the lunch periods have been staggered, which means uh, the uh, where normally um, say uh, first wave or second wave of lunches, especially in the high school uh, um, settings, uh, that they have uh, scaled back the number of students uh, in the elementary school. There are like two classes at a time. Um, the uh, times where there would be all of one grade level, that's not the case anymore. Um, the seating uh, are assigned, it's assigned seating, so the child sits in the same seat every day. There are markings throughout the uh, cafeteria, the floor, to uh, ensure that the children are spaced as far as standing and the uh, seats themselves where the children sit. Um, have been marked and the uh, launches are now basically bag launches. So it's a hot meal still, but it's a to-go uh, meal. So everything is given to them in a bag, but it's packed to go. So everything um, is basically uh, just uh, grab and go. That's the best way to put it. It's just basically grab and go. And for those uh, students who are driving up to the school to get a, a lunch, there is a um, area, a serving area outside the cafeterias at the school, but they simply drive by, they don't get out, they drive by and they pick it up themselves. But in that case, the child has got to be present. No ID is needed, but the child must be present. And it's the same way with the kids in the uh, school. Uh, they no longer need the uh, ID or the badges. They simply go through in order to um, limit contact, they go through, say what it is they want, 
it's all bag, it's all bag and packaged to go. They get it in the bag and um, that's how they do it. Okay, great information. So they are definitely trying to help us keep the kids safe in the schools. That is great. Okay, so our next question will go to Deacon Morgan. Um, what would you say to young black men who may get stopped by an officer and are not guilty of anything other than being black? Uh, what I would say, um, and I've said before, and it's become more and more uh, of an issue for me since I have a son now, um, but it's the same thing that I probably, that I have and I preach to my daughters as well. If you are, if, if contact is made with you from a police officer on a traffic stop or any other situation for us walking the street or whatever, the first thing we have to understand is that we have to be number one respectful. We have to be respectful of the law and the position that we And then the law needs to be respectful of us too. That, that, that is also true. But in uh -oh. order to get respect, you must give respect. Now, in some cases, being respected is probably not going to help. But in, the, in other words, what we have to do is that we have to understand that no justice happens on the street. There's no battle that you're going to win with a police officer on the street. In other words, you cannot champion your cause on the street. Let that be done in the avenue where it's supposed to happen at, which is in court. I tell my kids and I tell many of black males, if you're ever stopped by the police, have your information ready. That's right. Comply with everything that they say do. Don't get involved in a lot of conversations because I will tell you from experience, police officers have a way of talking you into- A fright, a, yep. That's true. A way of provoking you into a certain situation. So I tell people all the time, and I take this practice myself, I just got stopped a couple of months ago because they say my tent was too dark. He pulled me over. He asked for my information. I gave him my information. You don't have to answer a question about where you're going. This is a free country. You can go where you want to go. You don't have to answer a question about where you're coming from. It's a free country. You can go and come from wherever you want to come from. Long as your license is correct, long as your registration is collect, correct, and long as you have insurance information, then guess what? You're great if you're not riding dirty. But what, what ends up actually happening is that most people are riding dirty. So therefore, they feel like they need to champion a cause. But let's go back. Comply. Do what they ask you to do. Okay? Do what they ask you to do. Like I said before, you cannot win a battle. You cannot fight justice in the street. You will not get it. Because they've always told me and they always taught me the pen is mightier than the gun. What I write on a police report is what's going to matter the most, not what you say. But they also taught me as well, you might beat the charge, but you cannot beat the ride. I don't know about nobody else. I ain't trying to take no ride to jail. So comply, do what they ask you to do. Be respectful as much as you can, but also be as safe as you can. Don't pull over in a dark area. Don't pull over in, 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 in a place that's secluded. Pull over where, you, where there are gonna be some witnesses because we know that everybody has camera phones now. Everybody has a phone and every phone has a camera on. Everybody's looking for something to film in this day and time. Mm -hmm. Now, if the officer, if you do that and you have to, you happen to have to ride a half a mile till you get to some place like that, just explain to the officer, look, I just want to pull over in a safe area. That's all you have to say. And that's all he can do is respect that. But yeah, so we have to have these conversations with our kids in order what to do when we come into an in in interaction with the police. Because, you know, most of them go well, but most of them don't. So, you know, and, and we have to understand, too, that just like they teach you in, as a police officer that your number one goal every day you go to work is to go home. We need to teach our young men that that's our goal as well. It's sad, 
But every day we leave our house, we want to come back to our house. So we have to do whatever it is that we have to do in order to make that happen. If it's a goal for the police to go to, go to work, but yet still come home to your family, that's your job when you go on your daily, on, on, on whatever it is that you have to do on your daily errands or going to work or whatever, you want to come back home to your family. So don't get to the point where you feel like you have to go back and forth with the police to fight justice on the street or to fight justice in your car in order to right the wrong that you think is being done to you. There are plenty of avenues that you can do that to take that up. Okay. Thank you so much. Yes, we definitely need to um, take heed to that and talk to our kids about how to be safe on the streets in today's times. It's very important. So we want to um, actually just take a minute to have our pastor, Pastor Francis, has um, been able to jump on for a moment. And so he would like to just speak with us for a moment. Pastor Francis, are you there? Yes, yes, I am here. And I would like to say to all, um, thank you for um, coming out this morning and um, enjoying it. But I've been able to get um, just a piece of what's going on. Um, but all the information is very good. I'm saying I'm loving what I'm hearing and all and I'm um, really one of the reasons that I got on was to tell all the presenters. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you. Um, this is something in which um, me and the um, Christian education ministry came up with and you guys have came out very well prepared and um, your pastor says thank you. Thank you. And thank you. I will not take up any more of the time because my apologies that I'm not able to sit throughout the um, entire session, but um, work does call. But um, thank you once again for everyone and um, continue doing the things in which you do. And I will say this about the um, last thing in which Deacon Morgan just talked about as far as um, our young men and I'm going to say young women as well, young men and women as um, being black and living in today's time. It is not the most um, easiest of times but we will get through this. And as he stated, respect goes on both ends. I'm saying that just like we demand respect from the policemen, we have to give respect as well. But he gave a, he gave a lot of good pointers as far as the phones and uh, making sure we stay in light areas and things of that nature. But then also we got to remember, we're not just people that's doing this. We are believers. So we're held at even a higher standard as we um, conduct ourselves. We can't just conduct ourselves any kind of way and then come on Sunday praying and want things to work out better. As believers, we are held at a higher standard to make sure that we're conducting ourselves in a proper way. And so I just leave that at that. And then also thank you, Sister uh, Jones, Sister Titus, um, and Sister B for all the things, all the presenters. Y'all are doing an excellent job. I'm signing out. Thank you, thank you, and thank you once again. You guys be blessed. Thank you, Pastor Francis, for coming on. We really appreciate you today. Okay, so we're going to go back to our questions. We have just a few more. Um, we did have, let's see, Sister Francis had asked a question. Okay, so um, this is directed to Pastor Anita in regards to the nursing homes and if you have someone that is in a nursing home what is the proper protocol for that now uh because basically um i work in um uh, nursing homes uh, we definitely have to be an advocate um uh, because of our patients, um, 95, if not more, percentage of our nursing home patients are elderly. They are predisposed to all kinds of sicknesses, immune disorders, weaknesses. Um, they're diabetics. They got cardiovascular issues. They got open wounds. And so, therefore, in most of the nursing homes in, I know, Florida, uh, particularly, uh, they just like clinked it down, so to speak. There's no visitors. The doctors don't even come in. And so the only uh, people that are allowed in are really the health, the, the, the staff. And so that creates several issues. One, the social isolation without elderly. And what I want to encourage everybody, because that's why I'm such an advocate, 
for our patients that are in nursing homes because before, you know, mom or dad or sister or brother was coming out three to four days a week to see them, making sure that they're cared for, taking them out for fresh air. Now, all of a sudden, now, you know, they're quarantined. Now they are inside of the nursing home with no interaction, just in their rooms. And so that create behaviors, that create depression, that create um, some kind of deeper depression and more mental issues. So when, when you have our loved ones that are in the nursing home setting, then that means that if you have a, a family member, then you need to get on that phone and you need to advocate you know, I treat all of my patients equally, but when I know that I have a family member that's gonna be calling two to three days a week, baby, you better believe most times than not, they're gonna make sure that that family member is taken care of because I know that family is gonna call. You know, so if you have somebody in a nursing home because they are in a depressive state, they don't have the people used to come in and, and, and sing to them, dance for them, they're not going out. Uh, but only on uh, appointments for dialysis. The nursing home setting, our patients are getting weaker and getting more um, uh, autoimmune to different things. So I feel like we need to step up. If you have organizations in your ministry to go out or just to, to see what kind of uh, things that we could do as a community for our nursing home settings, uh, drive-by, sometimes they'll allow them to go out in the courtyard and they'll allow you to dance or sing or play. Um, so our nursing home setting uh, uh, residents really are affected in such a major, major way. But if you have somebody in a nursing home setting, just pick up the phone, call them, and let them know. Call them on the phone. And even if you don't, you just say, hey, my name is such and such, and I wanted to call. What is your depressed patient today? Bring them to the phone and let me encourage them. Because sometimes we may not have anybody in the nursing home setting, but just be an advocate of knowing that they are going through just as much as the rest of us. So I think that's what we need to do. Just know that they're, they're going through. Family members are not there to bring clothing. They're not there to encourage them. So just being an advocate for the nursing home, just in your community or in your area, get involved. I think the whole thing with all of us are saying, get involved um, as leaders in our community on every level. Um, I do know when our nursing home uh, patients, they when they go out, they are quarantined for 14 days. And so it's sad that we have to wear all the stuff, but they're quarantined. And so they feel like something is wrong with them because now we got to go in there with the mask and we got to go in there with gloves and gowns. So just calming down, especially if you're a nurse or a CNA, just explaining to them what you are doing and let them know it's nothing wrong with you. I'm just here to make sure you're safe and that I'm safe. So just being humane and just being the advocate for our senior population. Thank you so much, Pastor Anita. That was great information. So we definitely need to take care of our elderly and follow protocol. Okay, so as we are ending our session today, wanted to just talk with the panelists and see if you guys had any closing remarks. Uh, yes, if you don't mind. I just wanted to um, share the results of the polling that uh, you guys took from the question, are you registered to vote? And have you made a plan? Uh, 11 people um, took the poll and um, I'm, I'm sorry, 12 people, I believe. Um, and 11 of you said, yes, you are registered. And yes, you have a plan. And I just want to applaud you. Thank you. And just encourage you to stick to the plan. And also, uh, I wanted to, the person who has not yet registered, I just wanted to remind them <laughs> that you have until October 5th to register. And you can register online at DuvalElections.com, or you can go in person to the Supervisor of the Elections Office, or you can get a, um, a registration application and mail it in. So please, please, if you don't believe your vote matters, it does. It, does. it can yeah. it can make or break a decision. Trust me, one vote it, it can. It <laughs> um, I just got a message um, to uh, talk a little bit about 
the restoration of rights. And um, we do have a lot of convicted felons out there, uh, especially in our state of Florida, special Florida, uh, that have um, convictions out there. And we actually voted, the state did, actually voted in 2018, I believe, to uh, allow for um, felons who have done their time and that they can register to vote. We voted for that. However, since that vote took place, there have been obstacles put in place to keep that from happening. And you may have heard a lot about that where the governor decided that uh, not only did you have to do your time, you now have to pay for the uh, your fees or any penalties or any financial obligations you may have had out there because of the uh, conviction. Um, there, there are things are in place. There is a restoration, um, restoring restoration um, committee out there that's working very, very hard. You may have heard like LeBron James, Michael Jordan, Michael Bloomberg. People have been donating money to help convicted felons pay off their, um, their fines or their fees so that if they would like to register to vote, that they can. Awesome. Uh, if you are interested in that, um, you can reach out to me um, and I can direct you uh, for some specific help locally right here in Duval County that can help you. Uh, I actually got a text message today asking me if there was anybody that I know that needs to um, to pay those fines. There is help to do that. Uh, there is a website that's called Florida RRC that you can go out to. To uh, it's F L O R I D A R as in restorating R as in rights. <laughs> and see, okay? Um, that, that website would allow you to make application and go through that process. But if you are specifically interested and wanna get some, something done right away, feel free to contact me. Um, uh, my email address is btitus98 at, at bellsouth.com or you can talk to uh, anyone at the church. They'll know how to reach me. Um, uh, by phone or by email, and I will get you connected right away. But um, they they are trying to keep us from doing this, okay? Mm -hmm. Even though the voters have voted that that's what we want here in Florida. Hopefully that's helpful. Mm -hmm. Oh man, that's Thank awesome. so much. Yes, that was great information, Sister Brenda. Does anyone else have any closing remarks? Yes, my closing remark would just be, um, even in the pandemic, it may be a little bit overwhelming, um, but sticking together, following those necessary protocols, and um, I can't stress it enough, even though we believe God and we're praying, I tell my people to make sure, uh, even when we have services, you know, we, we, we check temperatures, we make sure we hand sanitize, we make sure we wear the mask. So it's very important to not to panic in the pandemic. Um, just, just make sure that we are following social distancing, um, we're following all of the protective measures to keep all of us safe. I cannot stress it enough, wear your mask children wear your mask don't get tired of them wear your mask especially when you're going to be in close proximity uh when you go into the store follow the rules and the guidelines hand sanitize i was outside the other day and a young girl walked past my house while i was outside reading and i didn't even know her i said baby you got your mask she said yes ma'am i said you got your hand sanitizer she said yes ma'am so getting involved and not being afraid um i carry mask in my car for people that i know I'm an advocate for homeless, so I make sure that on the street, I have a mask, I give it to them. So I think just getting involved, being an advocate, hand sanitizer, Clorox, bleach wipes, all of that stuff, just let's help one another get through this pandemic together and just stay safe every time you go outside, just get involved. 
Awesome. Awesome. Definitely get involved. Okay. Uh, yes, I, four uh, important things that I would like to end by saying. Uh, parents, it's important that you monitor your children academically and socially. I heard, uh, I think all the panelists uh, mentioned about um, the um, health, uh, mental health. Uh, so some of the time we always think about the adults, but we have to look at the fact that the children are going through this as well. So it's important that we monitor them socially and see how they are coping as well. The next thing is to uh, please sign up for a focus account, whether your child is online or in brick and mortar. In the event that we have to uh, revert back to like we did at this, in the spring and everybody goes back to online. So please make sure that you sign up for a focus account. Um, you, um, if you're having trouble signing up, the uh, number for technology, the IT department, is uh, 348-5200. Or you can visit the child's school or call the school, rather, uh, because some in some instances, you are allowed to go to the front office, and that's about it. But um, to call the school or to call IT, again, the number for uh, IT is 348-5200. Um, and the last thing is to make sure that we as parents pray over our children. Um, it's so important that we keep them covered, that we pray over our children, children as well as others. Uh, I do it, I do it for my own, but I also do it for those that I come in contact with too. So again, I thank everyone uh, for allowing me this opportunity this morning. And I hope that in some shape, form or fashion that I was able to help uh, someone. So be blessed, everyone. Amen. Powerful. Yes. Thank you so much, Sister Jones, for that information. Sister Brenda, did you want to say anything else? I know you had spoken about um, the voting, but are you? Did you have anything else you wanted to say? Or you get? <laughs> um, you know, it's just so important that we make sure our voice is heard. And I would just like to say, you know, for for all the panelists, when it talk, comes to our health as Minister Brown has mentioned, when it comes to our schools, as Sister Jones has mentioned, when it comes to our policing and our social justices, as Deacon uh, Morgan has mentioned, we have a voice about all of that and it's through our voting. And if we do not use our voice, then we don't have a say. So I just encourage of you all especially Take part in our local and our state voting. It's not just presidential. It is local and state, because you will be very, very surprised if you educate yourself where the policies and the laws are being made. That's right. All right, thank you so much. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you guys so much for coming out and sharing all of this important information with all of our guests and our congregation. So um, just wanted to just recap some of the information that was said today in regards to health. Um, you know, of course, we talked about wearing the mask, making sure your mask is over your nose, making sure you're also being informed if you have underlying conditions, what you should and should not be doing, and just staying on top of your health. and of course, boosting your metabolism. Um, our education, making sure your kids are getting the help they need if they are being, um, do, if they are doing the Duval homeroom and just being informed, stay on focus. If you're not on focus, definitely make sure you get an account so that you can be informed about your child's education. Um, voting, we definitely need to vote. We need to make sure we're getting out there. Um, if you have elderly parents, make sure you're taking them to vote. Yes. Um, get them out there um, because sometimes the mail doesn't work right and they may not get a ballot or whatever. Make sure you're checking on them with voting. And of course, our police and being safe and complying and being respectful when we're out, even though we may be in the right, everyone doesn't need to know that. So just be definitely respectful when you're being pulled over, and I always say saying less is sometimes better. So definitely keep
keep that in mind. But one of the things that I want everyone to take from this today is something that all of the panelists were very um, boisterous on is being involved, getting involved, staying involved. And one of the ways that we can do that is by getting out and voting because then our voices are heard. So thank you guys again for today. We had such a great time, lots of thank great information. Yes. Just, um, just boiling over with notes here with things to say and too much time. <laughs> okay, so what I would like for um, us to do right now is um, if Deacon Morgan could please close us out tonight, today. Yeah. Yes, thank you, Lord. And bow our heads in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you right now for our life, health, and strength. Thank you, Jesus. We thank you, dear God, for bringing us together in this forum, in this panel, in order to discuss things that greatly affect your people. Dear Father, we know that through prayer and through trusting in you, that you will make all things better. It may seem bleak at this point in time, but we know, dear Father, through the conversations that we have with mm -hmm. each other, most of all through the conversations that we have with you, that we will be made the better and that you will get the glory. Yeah. Dear Father, we thank you right now. We pray right now that you will just continue to bless those that are here, bless mm -hmm. those that were standing by listening, bless mm -hmm. those, dear Father, that were not able to tune in to listen today. But pray, dear Father, that we can be your vessels and go out and carry this information to your people so that we can all be made the better. And dear Father, as we go out into our world today, we ask that you will allow us to continue to be representatives of your son, Jesus Christ, the one who died on the cross for our sins, the one who not only was righteous, but the, the one that believed in righteousness, the one who treated everybody well. Yes, the Lord. One who always did what you wanted him to do, who was always in your will, Thank you, Jesus. Father, that if we follow those steps, mm -hmm. we follow that example. Hallelujah. The world it will be a better place. Yes, it will. Thank you again, dear Father, for allowing us to share. Hallelujah. Go on about our day, dear Father. Be with us. Be with us. Keep us right now, dear Father, as you <laughs> have before. Jesus. Things we pray in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Jesus. Amen. Amen. And amen. 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 Thank you, panel. You all did an awesome job. Very Thank good you. information. Thank you, Thank you all. You. Thank you. Thank Love you, so guys. Much. Love you. Bye bye. You have a good day. You too. Bye bye, everybody. Bye bye. Bye bye. Okay. Did I leave? Did I leave? Did I hang up? Okay. <laughs> okay. Now let me. Think I left good. I left good. Hey, brother Lewis. Ooh. Great job. Hello. <laughs> oh Lord, how do I leave? We can leave you. Jate. There you go. Hi, Lewis. Hello. <laughs>